The following broadcast is brought to you by Public House Media. The latest headlines. He's so much better as that number two option. The insightful interviews. Michael Scotto, basketball insiders. I don't think there's an Italian sit down between LeBron and Kyrie. The hottest takes. Teams that do run the system that Colin thrives in have starting quarterbacks. Can all be found on Press, Press Row. Row. Here's your host. You can only envy being that good ever in your life. Christian Heimel. Oh man, oh man, do I love this job. (laughs) It's just so much fun. You never know what's going to happen. That's the best part about sports. You never know what is going to happen on any day. You could watch the same sport for your entire life and still see something different every single day. It's one of the most beautiful things about it. The problem with that is sometimes the things that you see are just a little bit too crazy. Uh, And we had a lot of that. This past week in the world of sports. Hi everybody, I'm Chris and I'm a welcome on Press Row. So happy to be with you guys on Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, as well as part of the Public House Media Network on thephmedia.com. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Public House Podcast, as well as find us on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Heimel, Public House Media, as well you can find them on Twitter and Facebook also. Like I mentioned, a lot of crazy uh, this past week in sports, and I want to touch on a good chunk of it here. We're going to be talking with Jared Smith, New York City sportscaster, in about 15, 20 minutes. Talk to him about one of the crazy things that happened, which was on Monday night uh, after the Giants lost to the Detroit Lions uh, in, in a very embarrassing game for them. Their home opener in which they honored the 2007 Super Bowl championship team and the Giants offense well, much like it was in Dallas in week one, non-existent, some really bad plays, some really bonehead decisions made all around in the loss to Detroit. But Ben McAdoo, the head coach, saying after the game that one of the key points uh, in that game, the sloppy quarterback play on a fourth and one down at the goal line, in which really the Giants probably should have kicked a field goal anyway. Uh, and, and it almost seemed as though McAdoo kind of threw Eli Manning, the two-time Super Bowl MVP, under the bus in just his second year as head coach of the Giants. So we're going to talk to Jared Smith on a little bit about that, not just Ben McAdoo's comments, but the dysfunction that is the New York Giants right now. We'll touch on that in just a little bit, but I want to kind of start chronologically here and go back over the weekend because this the world of crazy, um, it, it, it seemed like it started on Saturday night uh, in that uh, insanely phenomenal middleweight boxing match between Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin. If you didn't get a chance to see it, one of the more exciting boxing matches um, that we can remember. I mean, the Mayweather-McGregor thing was a spectacle. This was an absolute boxing showcase. This was impressive from both sides of it. It ended in a split draw, which you can't really be mad of. It was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, but the, the real issue is with Adelaide Bird, the, the judge who helped make it a split draw, um, the fact that so one judge Don Trello scores at one fourteen one fourteen a full draw, uh, and then Dave Moretti scores at one fifteen one thirteen in favor of Triple G of Golovkin, where people have the issue isn't necessarily the draw, it's the fact that Adelaide Bird, the third referee, third judge, she scored at one eighteen to one ten for Alvarez. So again, here's where the first crazy part is. Number one. People aren't upset about the draw. They're upset about the discrepancy in the scoring. Big deal. It's a draw. Whether it was 118-110 or 111 one, or you know, 114-114, whatever it was, it doesn't matter because in that whole thing, it's still a split draw. So you can't be upset with the decision. Understand being upset about the scoring, whatever. Here's the part where it gets crazy, where sports goes crazy in, in this boxing match. Number one. This judge, Adelaide Bird, has apparently been um, protested before in her career as a judge or as a, as a scorer. Um, she has since, by the way, been uh, temporarily stood down from major fights. Um, so 
we don't know when we'll see her again in actual uh, scoring, but she has had multiple controversial scores in mixed martial arts, in boxing, throughout her career, to the point where some fighters have actually uh, threatened that they wouldn't fight if she was scoring. So that's where the crazy part is, is that a judge who, for so many fighters, they didn't even want to fight when she was scoring, was allowed to score one of the biggest boxing matches in the last 20 years, uh, probably the last 30 years as well. Um, but then the other part, and this is where it got really interesting for me, the fact that, and this is why I don't follow boxing. This is why I'm not a huge boxing guy. I can't follow it. There's no real hierarchy in boxing. You have all these made up titles, the IBA, the IBF, WBO, WBF, WBA. There's way too many titles and there's no one governing body. There's not one, you know, for instance, UFC is a governing body within mixed martial arts. Okay? Same with Bellator. Same with Strike Force. Same with the ACC, the SCC, and NCAA Collegiate Athletics. There are governing bodies within the hierarchy or within the chain of command, I guess. But in boxing, there is no real national governing agency that sets a standard or teaches these people how to score a round. Adelaide Bird has no better qualifications to score a boxing match than I do, other than the fact that she's probably watched more boxing in her life than I have. That is her only real qualification and thing that puts her or any other boxing judge up there. That's what's crazy to me. You want to know why boxing is basically dead to the millennial age and the Gen X age and anybody born after 1980? You want to know why? Two reasons. Number one, and this is kind of in jest, the Rocky movies ruined it because there's no such thing. The Rocky fights would have been stopped in the first round because guys don't take 75 punches to the face and then still come back before they actually land one punch and somehow win the fight. That doesn't happen. Number two is you have these so many different belts that nobody knows who to really follow. You have all of these people who are scoring the fights that... For whatever reason, there's all this controversy behind, and you have this idea that there's corruption within boxing. Well, yeah, we're going to get that idea when you have scorers like this who have such a discrepancy between their other colleagues. Now, it's one thing for all three judges to be completely wrong in in the eyes of the fans. At least they are all the experts, supposed, agreeing together. It's another thing for them to be very close in their discrepancies with one another. For instance, Dave Moretti scoring at 115 to 113 in favor of Triple G, as opposed to Don Trella scoring it right down the middle for both fighters. You wouldn't have this issue if Adelaide Bird said it was 116, 112 Canelo. It's the fact that it's 118 to 110. The fact that that was the big discrepancy. That's where people have and people are going crazy over this whole thing. And what does this do? This sets up a rematch. And what does a rematch bring? More money. And isn't that the ultimate goal here with all of this? Same with the Mayweather-McGregor thing. That's why so many people were talking about Mayweather throwing the fight just to get the rematch because he knew it would be more money. That's why people think there's corruption in boxing because it's talked about before the fight. That's how. It, that's why it's so crazy. And that's why people, especially my age, and again, I'm in my late 20s, I haven't really watched the last real boxing match I watched that didn't involve Floyd Mayweather, by the way. I, I've, I've seen four Floyd Mayweather fights, not including McGregor. I've seen him fight Canelo Alvarez. I saw him fight De La Hoya, uh, Manny Pacquiao, and Juan Manuel Marquez. Those are the four f- boxing matches that I've watched. Prior to that, I've seen highlights of Tyson Buster Douglas. I've seen the Tyson Holyfield uh, highlights. The only real big match I can remember prior to this one between two great boxers, and I'm not counting Matt Pacquiao Mayweather because it happened five years too late, was Haseem Rockman and Lennox Lewis. This is why we can't stand boxing is because there's no one to follow because there are too many titles to go after and keep track of. And then they can all come together, yet it's only for one of the seven belts or whatever that the guys own. And then you have scoring issues like this where there's such a discrepancy. If Adelaide Bird had just scored at 115, 113, or 116, 112, nobody would have this issue. But again, you don't have this issue if there's a national governing society or body that has a strict set guideline of how to score a fight and that we know about. 
It's about transparency. We want it in our politics. We want it in our offices. We want it in our homes. And we sure as hell want it in our sports. We want transparency. So that's where people went crazy, number one, on Saturday in the sports world. We went even crazier on Sunday when it's football season. And, of course, everybody goes crazy during football season with overreactions and whatnot. We talked about that last week. A lot of overreactions. And the biggest one this week probably came out of Dallas in Jerry Jones and Jason Garrett and the Dallas Cowboys and how pitiful they were against the Denver Broncos. They got absolutely smacked. They got outplayed. And I don't know what's crazier. Ezekiel Elliott only getting the ball nine times while Dak Prescott throws for 50 times, which is Jason Garrett's fault 100%. But when you look at the reaction after the game, So Dak Prescott throws an interception, and you can see the video if you haven't seen it yet. It's really easy to go and and look on, uh, uh, find it on YouTube or or Twitter or whatever it is. But Prescott's trying to throw to to Des Bryant, and instead it gets picked off, and Ezekiel Elliott, who's running a very similar route just a couple yards to the inside, just stops running. Doesn't even try to get back on defense, try to make a play. He just stops, puts his hands on his hips, and it's there for everybody to see. This could be it for a number of reasons. Obviously, Zeke's frustrated with the game. He's frustrated he's not getting enough touches. He's frustrated with losing. He's frustrated with all of this stuff, whatever. But at the same time, he's got to understand that he's a star in this league and he's going to have a camera on him at all times. He's going to. So then after the game, head coach Jason Garrett calls out Zeke for that. He basically said, uh, let's see here. Well, he had the two plays that were not good plays, the two interceptions, obviously. One of the things we preach to our team on both sides of the ball, when there's a turnover, everybody's involved. If you're an offensive player, become a defensive player on a fumble or an interception. Zeke is one of the most natural competitors I've been around. He loves to play. He loves to practice. Those two plays were not indicative of the kind of competitor that he was, and we have to get that addressed. So Jason Garrett throws his player underneath the bus, which... A lot of coaches do that when they're the ones making the issues and doing the mistakes. Um, Like Jason Garrett only giving Ezekiel Elliott the ball eight times and letting him run for nine yards, and that's being it. But then here's where it gets even crazier in Dallas. Jerry Jones comes out on his weekly radio appearance and says, quote, I think if you look at everybody's reaction to that interception, certainly on that interception, If you really look at several Dallas Cowboys players on that interception, you saw what would not be the case in a closely contested ball game. I think you can point to Zeke, but you really have to look at the general effort to chase that ball down by most of the people that were on the field. Dak now, of course, gave it everything he had to try to contain that interception, but still you look at it across the board and you'll see you need to find more effort than what you see. So Jerry Jones is defending Ezekiel Elliott saying that, Essentially, everybody else kind of quit on that play, but no, Ezekiel Elliott was the only one there. So this now creates a rift between Jerry Jones and Jason Garrett. And Jerry Jones isn't your normal owner like, say, Bob Kraft is or um, or the Roonies in Pittsburgh. He's a GM as well. He makes football decisions. And that's where it gets strange is when guys like Jerry Jones want to back up Ezekiel Elliott after the coach has thrown him under the bus and nobody wants to put the blame on anybody else. But now you're splitting it right down the middle between the owner being in favor of the young man at running back and Jason Garrett saying they have issues. Whether it's a simple issue as, as effort and, and learning that you know he's a young guy, he's what, 23? And he's got to learn to not be frustrated. And this is probably the first time in his life he's had a bad football game. And he's got the whole domestic abuse scandal and possible suspension hanging over his head. I can understand Zeke being frustrated. I can certainly understand if he doesn't give it 100%. But for Jason Garrett to call out a player like that, and then for the owner to come right back and defend the same player, it shows you just how dysfunctional things can really be in the middle of a football season. It's insane to think that. There's so much going on inside the locker room. And Jerry Jones is one of those owners and GMs. 
No other owner makes himself available to the media after every single game. He does. Why? Because he's got to be out there. He's got to say something. He needs that. Jerry Jones is very similar to Al Davis if or Dan Snyder even in Washington. If you're not talking about me, what are you talking about? That's an issue in Dallas. And you can see just how much Jerry Jones is desperate. Desperate for a Super Bowl. Especially with the signings of uh, of a guy like Greg Hardy, which we've already talked about. But for him to come out and start defending Ezekiel Elliott, that shows you just where his mindset is. It's uh, going against the coach that he has. Because he knows that Ezekiel Elliott is the best way they're going to win a Super Bowl. Now, I understand all the people, Dak had a bad game, and, and there are some people even going crazier saying they should, Tony Romo should be brought back. Stop it. Tony Romo is doing phenomenal in the broadcast booth, in my opinion. Two, Dak Prescott is in his second year. Okay? He is not Troy Aikman. And I will argue that Tony Romo was better than Troy Aikman, even though Romo never won a Super Bowl or even got to one. But Dak Prescott is going to be just fine. Same with Zeke Elliott. They played a Denver team that is built to beat Dallas. That defense is tremendous. Vaughn Miller is one of the best linebackers in the game, if not the best. Hakeem Tlaib is one of the best corners in the game. And no offense to Dallas fans, Des Bryant as a deep threat is all you got from a wide receiving core. Cole Beasley, eh. Jason Witten has lost a step, especially going up against Vaughn Miller. So Dak is going to have a bad game. Yeah, the defense was rough, giving up 42 points there uh, to to the Broncos and Trevor Simeon, who a lot of people are down on. But you know what? A lot of people were down on a number of different guys before they stepped in and actually became legitimate stars. You go around the league and you know guys like uh, Jake DeLome, who, yeah, he bounced around in his career a lot, but you know what? He was a pretty damn good player. Vinny Testaverde, Kurt Warner. Took a while. Takes the right system for these guys to actually be very talented. It takes the right system. You know? So who knows? Maybe Simeon does have great success there in Denver. But you can't really be... You can't have that type of rift between a general manager slash owner slash president and the coach when it comes to one singular player. It was a massive overreaction and everybody in Dallas just went absolutely cuckoo over the weekend after this loss, and it got even worse when Jason Garrett starts calling out Ezekiel Elliott, when honestly, he was he was right to. He quit on that play. He did. But, at the same time, you, know, you can understand where Zeke's coming from there. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying that it's okay for guys to quit on plays and quit on their team and all that stuff, but you know what? Zeke's got a lot more going on than just his team getting annihilated by Denver. Yeah, Dak Prescott made some mistakes, but so did a number of other guys. And in my opinion, it always starts at the top. It doesn't matter what sport or what aspect of life. It starts at the top. And Jason Garrett is what has been making the issues bigger for Dallas. When he decides that Dak Prescott needs to throw the ball 50 times instead of running it behind one of the best offensive lines and arguably the best running back in the game right now, save David Johnson, who's injured. That's Jason Garrett's fault. You know? You look at A.J. Green in Cincinnati after uh, right before the Bengals fired their offensive coordinator, Ken Zampezi. What did A.J. Green say after that game? I felt like I could have made more plays if I had been given the opportunities. The guys making the decisions are the ones to blame. And yeah, Prescott made a bad decision throwing that, that pass there to Dez because there's three guys around him. You're asking for a pick. But Jason Garrett also didn't help by forcing the play calls to be passing instead of runs. And you're not going to turn the the reins over to a second-year quarterback and give him the right to audible every single time. You know, he's not Peyton Manning, at least not yet. So, I mean, he's not, and, and don't get me wrong. You know, Jason Garrett's not the only coach to really kind of be that way. You look at it uh, all all across I mean, anytime a, a guy struggles or has a bad game, yeah, coaches are going to look at that. But the the most important thing is that coaches find a way to just say it 
in a different way. You know, the team needs to play better. We need to do a better job. It starts with coaching or, or it starts with preparation, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. All those, all those type of things. That's kind of where it really comes down. You know? And so I can't really be that upset at Jerry Jones. I, I'm more amazed at, at or should, excuse me, Jason Garrett. I'm more amazed at Jerry Jones rushing to Zeke's defense and then all these Cowboys fans freaking out about it. I don't get it. Cowboys fans are going to be just fine. Okay? Yeah, you're 1-1. One and one, But you know what? You're 1-0 in the division. And the Giants are about to get smacked this weekend by the Eagles. So, you know, I think Philadelphia is underrated. I'm not sure what to make of Washington. But I, th- I still think Dallas wins that division. So, it's week two. Let's calm down with the crazy, all right? You're on Press Row. I'm Christian Heimel, part of the Public House Media Network. Thank you guys so much for being a part of us, whether you're listening on Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Stitcher, or at thephmedia.com. We certainly appreciate it. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, comment, share us with your friends. Tell us all about it. You can find us on Facebook as well at Press Row Podcast. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Heimel. The whole theme of this show it has been and is going to be, uh, much like uh, Will Ferrell said uh, in old school, I like you, but you're crazy. That's that's what sports has been this week. I like you, sports, but you are crazy. And one of the crazier things did happen on Monday night, and that is when uh, the Giants lost at home in their home opener to the Detroit Lions, um, and head coach Ben McAdoo, uh, the post-game press conference, essentially calling out his two-time Super Bowl MVP and Super Bowl winning quarterback, Eli Manning. Jared Smith is a New York City sportscaster. He's seen the press conference on multiple times, and uh, Jared, th- that was certainly something to behold. Yeah, I think the slickest thing uh, in New York City football right now is uh, Ben McAdoo's hair, but that's about it because when he gets up on that podium, you could just kind of see the feeling of deer in the headlights look. Uh, I I, I don't necessarily know what adjective I would use to describe it because it is unique, but the, the plays that he was kind of singling out in that game that were important to him from the average viewer's perspective, and I mean, I, I know we watch this stuff more than the average viewer, but I still consider myself a fan deep down. I don't even know if the average Joe fan would have agreed with him. I mean, he's taking plays from the game, and, and the one that came to mind is the one that he singled out, you know, first and foremost. The fourth and one play uh, where Eli Manning was called for the delay of game, they didn't get the snap off in time, uh, and they ended up kicking the field goal. That was the play, that was one of the first plays that he singled out as one of the reasons that the Giants uh, lost that game. And two things come to mind. A, they should have kicked the field goal anyways in that situation, especially in the first half. And B, of all the other plays that happened in that game, why is that one the one that kind of pops out to him? I can think of three right off the top of my head with Brandon Marshall and Odell Beckham. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, not to mention all the countless times that the offensive line just completely crumbled. But Eli Manning, if anything, he didn't play a terrible game. Uh, he, he, his completion percentage was high. He was, you know, hitting throws. I mean, he was under complete heavy pressure the whole night. Uh, so for McAdoo to put the, 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 the spotlight squarely on that play and Eli Manning's lack of uh, ability to get the snap off in time, absolutely mind-boggling that that was the play that McAdoo singled out. When you look at Coach McAdoo, I think one of the things that bothers a lot of fans is that he's supposed to be an offensive guy. And even last year, though they went 11-5, and Jared, there really hasn't been much change in the offense. There really isn't an offense for this Giants team. I think the biggest issue right now is, is just their, their, their lack of being able to adjust. I mean, clearly you have an issue to left tackle right now with Eric Flowers. And I'm seeing time after time again, big backs, Orleans Darkwell, Paul Perkins, those are not scat backs. Those are not, you know, scrolls type backs. Those are big guys. Uh, they can be chipping. And if you watch a lot of the game film from, from, from that night, they were in a lot of third and long situations. So they, they, they needed to get their backs out to, to try to catch passes. But you need to adjust to the situation that you have. You need to play the hand that you're dealt. You need to keep Paul Perkins and Orleans Darkwell in the backfield to chip. Uh, Ziggy Anson in that situation. I mean, he, there's countless times watching the, the replay from that game where Orleans or, or Paul are just, you know, going out to the flat and trying to catch the ball and trying to be an outlet for Eli Manning, which they, they were effective in that role. But you need to give Eli time to push the ball down the field. Uh, he, Eli is still an accurate passer. You know, there's no doubting that his legs are a little bit uh, slower than they were when he started, and he's kind of a 
statue in the pocket, but there is nothing wrong with his arm. If you give this guy time to throw, he will push the ball down the field and find receivers. Uh, but time and time again, you just don't see that innovation up front. Uh, maybe it's the offensive line coach. Maybe it's not that McAdoo. Maybe they need to figure out a better scheme up front. Uh, but the the innovation and the adjustments are certainly lacking for the Giants offensively. He's Jared Smith, New York City sportscaster, discussing the debacle that has been the New York Giants for the first two weeks of the football season. Jared, the Giants, we know they have an all-pro defense. They didn't really need to do much there, but we knew it was going to be on the offense, and the only real change that they made was bringing in Brandon Marshall, who hasn't done really anything these first two weeks and really didn't do much last year with the Jets, did he? No, Brandon Marshall has definitely been a disappointment. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, as a, I'm a Jets fan, and I, I've watched a lot of those drops happen over the last two years. Now, he had a very productive season his first year in New York. Uh, his second year, you know, the quarterback issues, that's another story for another day. Uh, but, I, I, you know, Brandon Marshall is what he is. He's a big wide receiver that, that doesn't run the crispest of routes, but he's good in the red zone, but he, but he drops the ball a lot, too. Uh, Odell also has a, a drop issue as well. You saw that come to the forefront uh, in the playoff game last year, and he had a couple of drops last night, including the final play of the game on fourth down, um, or on Monday night, excuse me. Uh, but it, it, it gets to a situation defensively where now you're kind of running into that mode where, well, if the defense doesn't win us this game, we're not going to be in it. I mean, I think the, the number is, I think it's eight straight games for the Giants now. They've scored less than 20 points. That's just not going to win you a lot of football games in, in this league. Uh, you've got to be you've got to be explosive on offense. I mean, you know, you saw what you know Atlanta did uh, the other night to Green Bay. That is what an offense is supposed to do in the NFL. That's how you're effective in the NFL. You're able to move the pocket. You're able to push the ball down the field, and you're able to protect the passer. The running game comes with that. Uh, you know, this is a pass first run second league now, and the Giants really can't do either of those things well. So defensively, they really need to be relied upon. I think a big, a big issue the other night, too, was Janoris Jenkins being out. Uh, you saw Marvin Jones, you know, make a couple of plays deep down the field on Eli Apple, who kind of looked lost a little bit deep in coverage there. So hopefully you get Janoris Jenkins back this week, and, and, you know, you're facing a Philly team that is coming off a tough loss. Maybe they're licking their wounds a little bit, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's a must win this Sunday for the Giants. If you fall to home three, uh, the season pretty much, uh, with the division they're in, is, is almost a lost cause. You brought up Odell Beckham, and he's had an interesting first two weeks as well. Out for week one with the ankle injury, but rumors surface that he's dancing at a club on that ankle. And then on Monday night with the team down two touchdowns, he's celebrating a first down in the fourth quarter with a few minutes left. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I mean, this is, this is Odell Beckham is an all-world talent, and he can make the Giants better, and he has the ability to be a game-breaker every time he steps on the field. Um, but... I think the knock on him has always been his focus and, and, and where is his mindset? What is his end goal? Is it all about Odell or is it all about the Giants winning a Super Bowl? Um, I think those two things are very separate right now, and I think there's a large gap between them. Um, and we saw that evident last year with the whole boat gate and, and going on the, on the party boat to celebrate for the playoff game. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that that had any factor in dropping the ball in that Green Bay game, but it certainly didn't help. Uh, it, it, it's just the public perception. I think Odell is the kind of person he's kind of fed into this millennial social media generation of athletes that just get put up on that pedestal. And despite the fact that they haven't really earned that pedestal yet, you, you know, back in the good old days, and I, I'm only 32 years old, so to me the good old days is the 90s, uh, but before that, 70s and 80s, it, you didn't get to this level of stardom in New York City or, or anywhere unless you earned it, unless you won uh, they haven't done that yet. Odell's never won a playoff game. Eli Manning certainly earned that right. Uh, so I, I just think it's funny that week after week, time after time, we keep hearing these rumblings from Odell. The the You just continue to show the immaturity. Um, and, and that's something that I don't think the Giants can overcome unless he figures that out him, himself. Because the Giants can't be an elite team without Odell Beckham Jr. playing at his, at his best. I want to go back and touch on something with Ben McAdoo because he was the offensive coordinator under Tom Coughlin, and on Monday night, they're honoring the 10-year anniversary of the 2007 Super Bowl team at halftime, and heading into the locker room, they're being booed. The Giants are off the field. It seems as though fans really aren't going to stand much longer for for Ben McAdoo and his play calling. 
No, I, I think that was one of the more, uh, you know, interesting things from that Monday night game. I mean, you had that 2007 team in the house, and, of course, the magic that they did beating the Patriots, the undefeated, the, uh, undefeated Patriots in that Super Bowl. I mean, arguably that's the biggest upset in NFL history. Maybe if you throw aside the Jets over the Colts in Super Bowl three, But, I, you know, to have them in the house and to watch what was an absolute stinker. I mean, the Giants just laid an egg in that game. There's no other way around it. Um, it and, and I'm going to even go back further. Even before halftime, I think the Giants fans were booing in the first quarter after a couple of those three and outs. It, it does not take long uh, for New York City fans to turn on you. Um, it, as, as good as that Giants team was uh, during those years where all those great players were in the house the other night, I, I think you're starting to see the opposite end of that spectrum. Um, and it is disappointing. Um, it's unfortunate that Jerry Reese was not on the field to hear some of those boots. Maybe he was. I didn't see him. Um, but he is really the architect behind this current team. Um, and if you go back to the draft, he's taken a guy, Evan Ingram, don't get me wrong, great talent. But he's a, he's a want, not a need. The Giants needed help up front. And, you know, Jerry Reese decided to draft a lot of guys who were more finesse guys. Um, and you're seeing that now come to fruition in the style that this team plays. Yeah, you have to be good through the air. You have to be able to play in that, in, in that realm. But you have to be good up front. And the Giants are not good up front. I mean, look at some of the best teams in the NFL right now, Atlanta and New England. They are great up front, both lines. Giants have a great defensive line. Uh, but if they don't figure things out on the offensive line quick, they will finish this season maybe worse than the Jets record. Who knows? You brought him up, and he's the guy that I thought should have been gone two years ago instead of Tom Coughlin, or at least with Tom Coughlin, and that is general manager Jerry Reese. I'll leave you with this, Jared. Uh, at the end of this season, if the Giants don't make the playoffs, if they're a 500 team or below 500 team, does Ben McAdoo lose his job? Does Jerry Reese lose his job? Both of them or neither of them? I think you've got to look to Reese. I mean, you, you've already made that. I mean, it's, it's very rare in the NFL that, that you keep your GM – when you're going through a transition like the Giants went through when Tom Coughlin left. A lot of people, you're, you're right, I was one of them. I, I believe that when it was Coughlin's time to go, it was Jerry Reese's time to go as well, and you start from scratch and you rebuild. Um, they went the other way because they brought in Ben McAdoo before they got rid of Tom Coughlin. So it was kind of Reese's hire to, to get McAdoo in the system and promote him through the system from offensive coordinator to head coach like they did. So they, they, they kind of took an interesting approach to replacing a legend like Tom Coughlin. Now you're in this situation where Jerry Reese's eggs are in Ben McAdoo's basket. Uh, there is no successor waiting in the wings like there was a few years ago. So I do think that if one goes, they both go. But Jerry Reese certainly needs to be the first one to go. And I think you are currently, if you're a Giants fan and you're listening, I think right now, the, the type of, not effort, but the type of display of football acumen you're seeing on the field right now is the beginning of the end for a general manager in a town like New York City. You can get away with this in a small market. You cannot get away with repeated failures to, to put your team in the position to win like Jerry Reese has done over the last two years. Just an absolute, just turning a blind eye to your biggest need, and it, it's it's really going it, it to it, – it, it, it might end Eli Manning's career a year or two before he expected because, I, you know, they haven't faced a good pass rush yet. They're going to face one this Sunday in Philly. I, I hope Eli makes it out of there with all of his limbs. In it. I mean, it's going to be a rough game if it, if it continues like it was on Monday. On a short week, that's a tough matchup for them. And, and it, if, if it goes to 0-3 and, and they put up another stinker, I, I think you're going to start to see heads – uh, get get a little bit hot and hot seat kind of kind of warm up a little bit here in uh, the Big Apple. Biggest saving grace for the Giants, though. Everybody else one and one in the NFC East. Very true. Yes. Jerry, a win this weekend cures all. Winning winning cures everything. You find a way to pull this game out, and you know people are you know relating it back to the 2007 season where they started 0 and 2, then they went into Washington and they made a stand on fourth and goal, and then all of a sudden they you know they won the Super Bowl eventually. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen this time around. Obviously, a lot of things need to go right, and they went right after that game. But, you know, people love comparing history, um, and that's the comparison people are making this week uh, here here on the, on the talk radio. So we'll see if it happens. Sunday should be a very interesting matchup. Jared Smith, New York City sportscaster. As always, buddy, we appreciate it. Thank you, Christian. It's Jared Smith, New York City sportscaster. Always appreciate his time and insight here. And, and, and yeah, listen, I mean, if you're a Giants fan, it's it's a rough start at 0-2. Who, who would have thought the Jets would be overshadowed in terms of inferiority uh, that by the Giants this early on in the season? And, and I do think, and I've said this for a couple of years now, 
I think it all starts at the top with general manager Jerry Reese. He was the one who has known exactly where the biggest issues lie within this squad. They made it last year to the playoffs on an 11-5 and record, mainly because of that defense. And again, they had no running game, they had no offensive line, and yet because they were 11-5, and everybody's happy and they make the playoffs. Now that they're 0-2, having made zero adjustments to their offense, all they really did was get rid of Victor Cruz and sign Brandon Marshall, who drops everything as if it's 150 degrees. They didn't really do anything, and then they add maybe a one or two defensive pieces. You don't need that defense anymore. The Giants have one of the best defenses in the NFL, and yet Jerry Reese has done nothing, nothing to try and improve his offense, offensive line, anything like that. It's it's an absolute embarrassment, and if the Giants are a sub-500 team or a 500 team, miss the playoffs, he needs to be the first one to go. It's on Jerry Reese, and then it becomes Ben McAdoo's issue because once he has the players, and, and I'm giving him a, a little bit of credit just because he was an offensive coordinator for a couple of years with Eli Manning, and he knows how to win with Eli. But I don't understand how this Giants team, with the offense that they have, the play calling that they make, the decisions that are made by the head coach and by the general manager. It's a very frustrating time for New York Giants fans, but it's going to get even worse, honestly, especially this weekend when they go to Philadelphia and uh, you know take on an Eagles team that... I think is is sorely underrated. Um, so we'll see what happens. You're on Press Row. I'm Christian Heimel. Happy to be with you guys here again as part of the Public House Media Network. You can find us all over the place. Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spreaker, and of course, thephmedia.com. Uh, theme of today's show has been has been crazy. You know, sports are crazy, but we love them. And um, a couple other things in, in football that really kind of caught my eye this week from a, from a crazy standpoint is... How upset, apparently, that Los Angeles Chargers ownership is that fans aren't coming to their games. And, and same with the Rams. And you looked at it this past weekend, and the, uh, you know, the, the USC Trojans, who are the fourth-ranked team in the country, um, as well as uh, the, the US, as USC-Texas game this past weekend, completely outdrew the... Uh, Two pro teams in Los Angeles, the Chargers and the Rams, outdrew it by more than a few thousand. So, you know, it's it's it. And here's the thing: I, I don't understand why the people, the, the Chargers, Dean Spanos and, and and his ownership group. I don't get how they're upset that people aren't embracing the Chargers. Number one, your team's not good. So to move to a new city and not be good certainly doesn't help. Um, you know, you need to establish yourself as a legitimate team before you can actually be embraced. And yes, I know the Chargers have had success. I know they've made playoff games before, but it's been a long time since the Chargers were a legitimately competitive team. And yes, you've got a first ballot Hall of Fame tight end, probably one of the greatest ever in Antonio Gates, as well as a guy in Phillip Rivers who, you know, it may be if he has a better defense every now and again. He he could be a Hall of Fame player, but the Chargers are a terrible team. They're playing in a soccer stadium they can't even sell out, and they're playing two hours away from their usual fan base. I don't understand how the ownership for the Chargers is really that perplexed by the lack of fan interest. You're not good. Your fans aren't from L.A. They aren't even in L.A., and yet you expect them to show up in droves on the first couple weeks of the season. No, that's not how it works. It's just not. You look at L.A. and the history of football in L.A. The Rams were there and and the Raiders were there. And that kind of makes sense then for the Rams if they're going to start getting some fans back. And yeah, that they had a, a rough, you know, last year when they opened up at, at the Coliseum, they had a pretty solid crowd. They had a really good crowd, but this year, I think it was like 57,000 in their home opener this year for a Coliseum that seats over 80,000. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not really the Rams. I can see having more fans because they used to live there. Some of the fans that are in LA, some of the natives of LA probably old enough to remember the LA Rams. So they're excited for them to be back. And you got a little bit of excitement with that team. I don't know what Jared Goff is going to be or Tavon Austin or, 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 you know, Cooper Cup or any of these other guys that are on this Rams squad, Todd Gurley. But you've got some excitement there. First year, a, a new head coach, there's some excitement there in the Rams. 
For the Chargers, what do you got? You got nothing. You got some really bad teams playing in a very competitive division in the AFC West where you're going to get slaughtered by the Chiefs this weekend. And you're playing in a new town two hours away from where your fans were, not to mention the fact that there were reports that it was $60 to park, something like 100 bucks for tickets. You're spending $300 just to go and watch a game, and you and if you're a Chargers fan from San Diego, you're driving two hours to do that? No, it's going to take time for these things to happen. you got to win number one. you got to have a really good fan experience at the actual game. And then number three, you got to actually build some history within the city. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, look at <clears throat> look at when the Browns left for Baltimore. The reason why that they were embraced is because Baltimore had the Colts before. Or when the Colts left for Indianapolis, it took time in Indy for those to really catch on and be a thing. You know, I mean, it takes time for this. So I don't get why Dean Spanos and, and everybody else is surprised by this. What's amazing is the fact that USC Texas outdrew both of them. You want to know why? USC has been established for decades. And they've been a good team. Granted, it's been a while since they've been this good. But you're talking about a former national powerhouse in college football. And one of the greatest championship games of all time. USC Texas and a rematch of that? Of course that game's going to sell out. But here's the other part. When we talk about people who are surprised that, a, that one college game outdrew two professional games in the same weekend. You want to know why? The alumni base is so much bigger than the fan base of any team, especially for USC. The alumni base for USC is insane. And then you couple that with an actual fan base of people who maybe didn't go but just love USC, loved Matt Leiner or uh, OJ or, or any of those other guys who played years and years ago, Reggie Bush, <clears throat> Mike Williams, all those guys. I mean, come on. I don't get why people are surprised that USC Texas outdrew both the Chargers and the Rams this past weekend. Rams play in a soccer stadium, 27,000. Okay? The only way you're going to outdraw the Trojans if you're combining Chargers and Rams is the fact that, you know, one, the Rams sell out the Coliseum, nearly 80,000, and then the Chargers sell out their soccer stadium. (laughs) But again, you can't have an exorbitant, it can't cost an arm and a leg to go to a game in a town where you've never been before. You can't do that. So I don't get why Dean Spanos... Spanos is crazy, number one, for leaving San Diego. And number two, for thinking that, for whatever reason, they should automatically just be welcomed and owned by the city of Los Angeles. It doesn't make sense. Los Angeles, these are this is a fan base that cares about the Lakers only when they're good. It's like anything else. You, you, if you don't have that established history, like the Lakers, like the Dodgers, like the LA Kings... If you're not good, nobody's showing up. It's not like Cleveland, where even though the Browns have sucked for 20 years, you still get a lot of fans to show up because it's passion. You don't have that yet. It's going to take some time, so calm down, Spanos. Relax. Another person who needs to really kind of calm down is RG3. Uh, This is a guy who isn't in the league anymore. He bounced around a lot. Of course, injuries. Very talented player when he was healthy. But if you haven't seen this, this was pretty it, damning from what Santana Moss, his former wide receiver for a couple of years, uh, said in a weekly radio show in D.C. Uh, he said, Santana Moss says, quote, Come 2013, all of a sudden it's a whole big dilemma in the locker room, in the meeting rooms, and just in our building that you know the man, Mike Shanahan, and RG are not seeing eye to eye. We're players. We sit back and let things be done. That's not something that I partake in, so it's not nothing that I'm interested in. And before you know it, RG's not playing. I'm not sure if it was Griffin's whole plan, but when the whole thing went about, we hear that Mike Shanahan's not coming back next year. Then we hear the quarterback like, like hey, mm-hmm, like basically saying that, hey, you got me out of here not playing last year, the last few games. Then that's what happens. You get fired. You can't do that. It's it's interesting. Uh RG3, so so here's what, what Santana Moss is apparently saying, that RG3 was gloating and that it was his whole plan to have Mike Shanahan fired after 2013 because Griffin was benched for the last three games of the year, uh, going 3-13 and after Griffin led them to 10-6 and in his rookie season. Or that at least Griffin wasn't happy about Shanahan and wanted him there. Griffin responds on Twitter saying, No subtweeting needed. Santana Moss, I treat you like a brother and have always had your back. To openly lie about me is a betrayal. 
Interesting. So then he keeps saying, RG3 keeps going on. Been lied on a lot over the years, put in an impossible situation with a coach who never wanted me, made players like Santana Moss a believer through hard work, film study, showing up early, leaving late, putting in the extra hours, staying after practice, and getting work in. We won the division that year. Next year, coach wants out, says he wants out, says he never wanted me as his quarterback, and I get blamed. He's not exactly wrong. I mean, you, you look at it, and, and RG3 is a guy who just is really interesting uh, to see his career progression. I mean, he comes on in a firestorm at 10-6 and six his rookie year. They win the division. Mike Shanahan apparently doesn't like him, doesn't think that he's the quarterback that Mike Shanahan wants. And this is a guy who had John Elway, remember. He kind of knows a few things about quarterbacks, but didn't want him, benches him for a little bit in favor of Kirk Cousins, of course, with the knee injury and all of that. Shanahan's out. Jay Gruden comes in, and, and RG3 is all of a sudden out of Washington. And then he's in Cleveland, where, yes, he gets voted team captain, but he's not really doing anything in Cleveland because he gets hurt again. And now he's out of the league in general. So I don't really know what to think. But all I do know, and and it's well documented, that Shanahan didn't want Robert Griffin. He's even said in an interview, said he didn't, he thought they gave, the Redskins gave up way too much if you did if they didn't know that Griffin could even drop back and throw. I mean... <laughs> A lot of it has to be the fact that Dan Dan Gilbert wanted, or not, excuse me, not Dan Gilbert, Dan Snyder wanted RG3 because this was an era where the scrambling quarterback was a big thing. That was the era. That was how it was and how it is in the NFL. It's not anymore. It's back to the pocket passer and that type of thing. But I find it hilarious how much people care about what other people say in their own sport. It, it's, it's turned into high school. It's turned into mean girls in professional sports. It really has. It's like everything is WWE. I mean, you saw with McGregor Mayweather and how much trash talking there was going on. Now, a guy like Santana Moss says something about RG3, and RG3 has to go off on a whole Twitter firestorm. You've got Kyrie Irving and LeBron James and Steph Curry subtweeting each other. Or Steph Curry mocking, quote-unquote, LeBron James with a dance at a wedding, and, and everyone's wondering, how does that make LeBron feel? Who cares? When do we all get excited about someone's feelings in sports? Your job is to go out there and perform at the highest possible level. I mean, I understand you want everybody to like each other on the team, but those are your teammates. What do we care about what other people think? Like, I, Would it matter? No. You go out there and you play and you win. It's become too sensitive in sports, and this is where social media doesn't help at all. It's speaking of sensitive in social media, I, did you guys see this? Kevin Durant? With multiple fake social media accounts that he's using to defend himself as somebody else to Kevin Durant's critics? Dude, come on. Unbelievable. He's got multiple. And then he has to go and apologize for it? That's unbelievable. On Kevin Durant comes out over the weekend and he says, I have another Instagram account, but that's just for my friends and family. So I wouldn't say I was using it to clap back at anyone. I use Twitter to engage with fans. I think it's a great way to engage with basketball fans. I happen to take it a little too far. That's what happens sometimes when I get into these basketball debates about what I really love to play basketball. I don't regret clapping back at anybody or talking to my fans on Twitter. I do regret using my former coach's name and the former organization that I played for. That was childish. That was idiotic. All those types of words. I regret doing that and I apologize for that. What? Like, so, different Twitter accounts. First off, you guys do know that to have a Twitter account, you have to have a separate email address. Like, you can't have two Twitter accounts for one email. How many emails does this guy have to be able to do that? And I understand wanting to engage with fans, but... Dude, people are always going to hate. It's part of what they do. They're always going to hate you for leaving Oklahoma City, saying you had to go and play for the Warriors to win a championship. You know what? Rodman had to go play for the Bulls. LeBron had to go play for the Heat. So what? You got paid. You're one of the top five players in the world. 
you're, in my opinion, one of the craziest athletes in the game, if not the best athlete in the game. You got your title, you're getting paid, you're playing on a team where you don't really have to be the focal point anymore and you don't have all the pressure put on you because it's all on Steph Curry and you've got you know, Draymond Green who just pops off at the mouth whenever he wants taking away some pressure. What are you doing trying to defend yourself to people? Just let it be. People are going to be pissed off for no good reason whatsoever. Let them. I, I, this is where, and, and remember, Twitter was made for trolls. Not maybe in a sense that, like, that's not what the intention was when it happened, but guess what? That's what it's made for. It's made for idiotic people with no face and no name to come out and bash you and try to bait you into doing something stupid just for a click-worthy grab. Like, I I don't... Unbelievable. He's impressive. I mean, it's... I don't get it, KD. KD. Don't stop engaging with fans. That's fine. I love when an actual athlete responds to their fans, has conversations with them. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is phenomenal at this. Phenomenal at it. Every single race day afterwards, he does a live Periscope thing on Twitter where he gives his thoughts for the day. And then he responds to fans on Twitter. He ignores the idiots and the trolls, but he actually takes the time and responds. That I love. But he does it from his own account. He doesn't create fake accounts to defend himself. Come on, KD. You're better than that, man. You are. Just win, baby. Win. It's that simple. Unreal. I'm Christian Heimel. This is Press Row. So happy to be a part of your guys' day, wherever you are listening. However you're listening, Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spreaker, thephmedia.com, however you are listening to us as part of the Public House Media Network. We're so happy to be a part of you. It's been a crazy week in sports. Again, we love it, though. Uh, one, a couple of things I want to touch on before we close out in the world of baseball. Uh, number one, uh, if you hadn't heard earlier this week, Tuesday, uh, Major League Baseball broke its single-season home run record as a whole, the former record set in 2010, uh, in which Major, excuse me, 2000, in which Major League Baseball hit something like 5,600, close to 5,700 home runs. Alex Gordon, uh, 5,694 home runs, the record uh, after Alex Gordon did it on Tuesday night, and obviously still climbing uh, in Major League Baseball. And the part about this that's crazy is how many people, what they're saying in terms of why this home run number has gone up. And there are a couple of different things. I mean, number one, everybody keeps saying, at least Major League Baseball keeps saying, oh, it's the launch angle. It's the launch angle. No, it's not. I mean, for a couple of guys, maybe. I, it, I love Josh Donaldson. If, if you guys ever get a chance and you haven't yet, YouTube Josh Donaldson on MLB Network talking about the art of hitting and how when Little League coaches, he literally tells kids to ignore their Little League coaches if they ever say hit on the top half of the ball. He says, you want to know why? Because hitting on the top half is ground balls. Nobody Nobody likes to see a ground ball. They want to see home runs. So get underneath it, launch angle. That's all Josh Donaldson, 100%. But you can't tell me that everybody else is doing the same exact thing, and that's why we have this huge influx of home runs. You just can't. I mean, now, there are some other things, and there's evidence to the fact that the baseballs are a little bit different. And Major League Baseball won't admit it, but you've had multiple players and pitchers and even you know, hitters say that the baseballs now have a smaller seam, a lower seam. The baseballs now have a lower seam, and and that limits the resistance. And that, coupled with some guys just getting stronger, that's all what it's all about now. It's about getting bigger, getting stronger. And I'm not saying that there's, you know, a new form of PEDs and we're heading into another steroid era, but all these guys are lifting now, and they all look like John Carlos Stanton or, or Aaron Judge. I mean, you look at some of these big home run hitters, and they're massive. Look at their biceps. Look at their chest. All they do is lift. All they do is lift. So I I do think it has something to do with the the ball. But again, the part that's crazy about it is that so many people are naive to this idea that maybe something else is being done. And I don't think baseball did it on purpose. I don't think there's collusion or a uh, um, conspiracy there. 
But in 2015, a slight manufacturing change and, and the regulations for Major League Baseball to the manufacturer of the baseball are broad enough where a small change can be made and it's not illegal, it's not wrong or anything like that. But again, I mean, the problem with this, I don't know why we're so surprised. This is what people wanted, right? You want to see home runs. You want to see it. But the problem, that's what they think is what brings in everybody. No. What brings in fans in, there's a reason why the fan bases are, are leaving and why Major League Baseball is having a, a, a crisis in terms of getting people to the games, is number one, most of these guys who are home run hitters, they're all strikeout guys, so it's all they do. It's boom or bust. It's, it's, it's Mark Reynolds. It's home run or strikeout. That's not fun to watch. And then you got stadiums like Yankee Stadium, which costs so much money just to get to and park, and then the food is outrageous. The prices are so high that baseball is a blue-collar sport. Same in the way football is. But if it's too expensive for people to go, they're not going to go. Then the other part is, is now that it's more about the fan experience than anything else. It's more about the fan experience than the game because of our attention span. So places like City Field, places like... Wrigley, where there's stuff to do and walk around and see. You know, look at the new Falcons football stadium. There's stuff to do and see there, so you don't have to just watch the game if that's what you're there. I mean, sure, if you want to just watch the game, do it. I, I would prefer you do. But I don't understand why people are so crazy about this home run number and then also seeing the, the fans, you know, the lack of. So, whatever. Last thing I want to mention, and, and, and this is a little bit of a somber note, um, if you didn't see it, uh, yesterday on Wednesday uh, in that Yankees game against the Twins, Todd Frazier hit an absolute missile, a foul ball that hit a young girl in the face. Uh, she was taken to the hospital um, as of we're recording this Thursday morning. As of this, we don't know further. All that we know is that she was taken to a hospital uh, in New York. Uh, she was bleeding, was tended to at the stadium and then taken to the hospital. Uh, they didn't know if she was going to need surgery or not, but uh this is what's crazy about this to me. What's crazy is the fact that it's going to take stuff like this or something even worse for Major League Baseball to do to implement and mandate that the netting go further down the line than it is. They made it mandatory in 2015 to go to the inner part of the dugouts. It needs to go all the way down, if not further. City Field... And I credit the Mets for this. They have it going all the way down to the foul line. Fans who say it's going to impede, no, it doesn't. Minor league baseball is mandatory. And I've worked in minor league baseball for a while now. You don't even notice it. You don't. It it makes the experience safer for everybody. It makes it much more enjoyable. I don't understand why this isn't a mandatory thing yet. I mean, it's it's on unbel- this. This is a little girl who, if she needs surgery or who knows, but this is the third time something like this has happened at Yankee Stadium, where a fan was hit in the head on a foul ball by Aaron Judge on July 25th, and then in May, a boy was hit with a portion of a broken bat behind the dugout. If you don't extend the netting, you're putting fans at risk. And you want to know? I talk to a lot of fans, a lot of baseball fans who sit there and go, we don't want to go because we're scared. Or we don't want to sit that close because we're scared we may get hit with a foul ball. They come at you at 120 miles an hour off the bat. So I don't understand why Major League Baseball hasn't done this yet. And if they don't next year, that's absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy and embarrassing and shameful. Our prayers are with the little girl and her family. Hopefully everybody is okay. But if you saw it yesterday and you still don't think the netting should be mandatory all the way down, I don't know what to tell you. I really don't. I want to thank you guys so much for being a part of the show. I want to thank Jared Smith, New York City Sportscaster, for joining me, talking New York Giants football and the debacle that is their football team so far this year. Don't forget you should subscribe, rate, review, Google Play, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spreaker, vphmedia.com. Find us on Facebook, Press Row Podcast. Don't forget to submit your questions each and every week. You can find me on Twitter as well, at Chris Heimel. And until then, it's been a crazy week in sports, but we'll see you on Press Row. You're crazy. I like you. But you're crazy.